Hello, and thanks for joining today's discussion, The Future of Modern Web App Security, Essential Considerations for WAP Success. I'm your host, John Grady, Senior Analyst with the Enterprise Strategy Group. I'm very excited to be joined today by Tom Hickman, the Chief Product Officer for ThreadX. So Tom, before we dive in, why don't you share some of your background with developing and securing cloud applications? Sure, John, thanks for having me today. So I spent my career bouncing back and forth between building products and selling those products to other people and then running products that I buy and that I build inside my own data centers. I've been in a number of venture-backed startups that have been, you know, fortunately acquired by larger companies. So I've run the gamut from 12-person organizations to 300,000-person organizations. I've built and deployed software into clouds when we just called them data centers, uh, before cloud was a buzzword, before SaaS was even a buzzword. So I've been doing this for a long time. And I've gone back and forth, as I said, between building services and putting them into you know, internet facing data centers or clouds and building solutions that protect those services for my customers. Perfect. Well, I'm, I'm excited to get your perspective as we, yeah. uh, we go through the talk here. So as I said, we're, we're here to discuss the emergence of web application API protection or WAP. And that's really an alternative to traditional web application firewalls. But before we dive into the control side of things, I want to kind of set the stage with what's going on kind of at a higher level with the application space. So we know apps have become critical to the success of nearly every business and the number of apps that organizations support continue to increase. Our research has found that most organizations, almost 90% support at least 100 business apps in their environment. Some of those are SaaS, but 60% say roughly a third are internally developed. And so securing those is really top of mind. So from what you've seen and, you know, gone through, um, you know, as you've developed apps yourself and talking to customers, what are some of the main challenges that organizations are facing with securing modern apps? Yeah, sure. So I think of it in simple terms, location, 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 right? The first one, where in the world is your origin server? Where is that app running? Is it in your data center? Is it in your cloud? Is it in um, a data center in Europe? Is it in a data center in Dallas, Texas? The next is where in the tech stack is your security control plane? Is it an agent sitting on a Java VM? Is it built and instrumented into the source code of your running services? Or is it a control plane that sits you know, in a sidecar you know, at, a, at a control point you know, somewhere in the cloud interceding traffic between your clients and your, your services? And then the last one is you know, where in the world are you as an enterprise with your data center and your infrastructure? Um, you know, we, we work with customers of all size and I don't think we have a single customer that is a mono cloud. Everyone is cloud hybrid. Everyone has a little bit of infrastructure in AWS, maybe a little bit of infrastructure in GCP. They have a, their own private data center. They still run services and servers, you know, on, on-prem. And in that world, you've got a very complicated and heterogeneous landscape to protect. Absolutely. So you touched on kind of the, the fact that organizations are becoming more distributed and application development is becoming more distributed as well, right? And so our research has also found that one of the top challenges organizations face with AppSec tools is integrating with DevOps processes in particular. Uh, and really the, the fact that application security controls haven't kept pace with some of the changes to development processes and not to mention the sophistication of attacks. So why is there such a disconnect between security tools and the environment that they're there to protect? Well, that's a great question. And, and it's one that, that's vexed me as a builder and a maker and, you know, giving me a really fun problem space to work in as, as a, a vendor and a provider in the space. So it's a little bit of a perfect storm going on now, but re really for the last decade. You've got an explosion in complexity. You've got an explosion in pace. Your attack surface is growing. Your network heterogeneity is expanding. Uh, your app tier heterogeneity is expanding. We don't have monolithic apps. We don't have a single tech stack. We're assembling as much as we're coding and building. We have an increased reliance on data-driven solutions. Our customer expectations are ratcheting up. If you're on the build side, if you're a dev leader or a dev team, the business expectations for how fast you can turn around a solution are insane. We would never have moved this fast 
10 years ago, much less 20 years ago. And we're not moving fast enough as an industry to keep pace with our competitors and with customer demands for innovation. Then you couple in the attack side and, and there's reward for the bad guys, right? They are able to monetize data that they can exfiltrate from apps um, all day, every day. So you, you roll all of that together and you've got increasing uh, complexity, increasing speed, better tooling, easier provisioning and management of infrastructure, and then purposeful bad guys who look at all of that as just you know, a target rich environment. Yeah, great points. And you know the, the speed act aspect, security used to be able to pump the brakes, right? And say, right. no, you can't, right. you can't do that. And they no longer have that level of control. It's incumbent on security teams to figure out how to work at the speed the rest of the business is operating at. Um, which- yeah, we, we've seen a shift um, where, where CISOs are, are really have to position themselves as business partners to enable the pace of yeah. development while simultaneously kind of you know, ensuring compliance and ensuring protection of the core data assets that these apps rely on. Absolutely. Yeah. So that was a great answer and, and kind of broad. Let's kind of drill a little more into web app firewalls in particular, because yeah. it's been a cornerstone of application security for many years. Um, in a lot of cases, they're necessary to meet compliance requirements, um, but for whatever reason, you know, they're, they're deployed, they're a big part of the strategy. Um, but they leave a lot to be desired and we've known this and it's been a topic of discussion in the industry for a while. So what are some of the top shortfalls with traditional WAFs, uh, especially kind of as it relates to all the issues we just laid out? Yeah, so, so I, I could go on and on about the shortfalls of traditional WAFs because you know, we built our solution here at ThreadX in the face of those shortfalls. So it was sort of our origin story was that you know, our founders had deployed traditional NGWAF solutions in their jobs, looked at it and said, there has to be a better way. Uh, so the things that drove them crazy and that drove them to start our, our organization are still true in large about the industry. Signature-based blocking rules are difficult to manage, imprecise and create, you know, essentially a house of cards that requires ongoing care and feeding, ongoing maintenance and tuning. Um, and doesn't really produce a, a great result in the face of novel threats. So what we hear over and over again echoed you know, in, in our customers who are revending in a sense their NGWAP solution and looking to a, a WAP provider like us is that they need a solution that scales, they need a solution that manage, manages you know, a favorable FP rate, blocks novel attacks, blocks sophisticated attacks, and does so you know, with a, a minimal amount of, of sort of expertise from their security staff, meaning you, know, you can bring it in, turn it on and be blocking without having to get a master's degree in you know, somebody's WAF configuration parameters. Do you have any kind of customer or prospect examples that you can share with us when, when these shortfalls have kind of come into play? Yeah, great, John. So, so one case uh, is, is some referrals and recent customer wins that we've had in the credit union industry. Uh, credit unions are, are facing novel attacks that are sort of moving credit union to credit union with the same attack patterns using some of the same techniques and some of the same botnets. And we've been able to catch sophisticated attacks that we're getting right through the perimeter protection and the NGWAF protection that these customers prospects when we talked with them had in place. So they came in as, as what we call hot POCs where they're under uh, an advanced attack uh, at scale, at speed, and they call us up and they said, hey, uh, you know, we understand that you've been able to block this attack. It's getting through our, uh, our protection from vendor X, I, I won't name names. Uh, we've been able to, to bring our resources to bear, onboard them into our application and turn on rule-based and risk-based blocking and stop attacks that we're getting through other solutions. Those other solutions were signature-based. They were often you know, sort of security unit taskers and where we take a, a, a multifaceted approach and, and really all WAP providers take a multifaceted approach to managing risk. Um, you know, we're able to catch things that we're getting through the cracks of other solutions. Yeah, obviously there's a kind of efficacy play there, but if I'm reading between the lines as well, 
uh, ease of deployment, which is not something we've typically associated with, with WAF. So if you're able to go in and that quickly start to stem the tide, so to speak, and, and block attackers. Yeah, exactly. Quickly yeah. seen. The, um, in, in that case, you know, put, putting a blatant plug in for the architecture that we like, we deploy as a reverse proxy, which means um, essentially customers come in, they change a CNAME record, they point their client traffic to us, we cleanse the traffic and then proxy that traffic onto their origin servers. That can be done in you know, minutes, not days or weeks. The competing solutions, and I've built some of these solutions in, in previous companies, uh, anything that's agent-based has you know, a multi-week deployment cycle, best case, and sometimes a multi-month deployment cycle. It may only cover you know, a portion of the, the application landscape that's amenable to an agent-based solution. And by being a control plane kind of at the perimeter of the network in a proxy choke point, of course, auto-scalable, we're able to come in, um, turn on, deploy you know, via Ansible scripts, deploy into the cloud, uh, do a CNAME record change, and we're off and running you know, in the same day, often. So we've, we've kind of uh, referenced WAP, but let's be very clear on what we're talking about because this is an emerging space. So it's, it's the idea, it stands for Web Application API Protection. Yeah. Um, it's the idea of combining WAF and API protection, obviously those are in the name, as well as bot mitigation and DDoS protection in a, a single solution to address a lot of the issues we've discussed, changing app environments, um, the fact that attacks have evolved and ultimately you know, the need for protection to be better integrated across multiple threat vectors um, to, to, to address those issues. So talk a little more about where this idea of WAP emerged from. Well, APIs are the building blocks of modern web applications. And attackers know this. Attackers don't differentiate between attacking, you know, a static URI and attacking an endpoint that, that takes, you know, JSON encoded traffic. So, you know, we when we built ThreadX, you know, the 1.0 iteration of the solution, we didn't differentiate between attack types. And, you know, I've kind of taken the stance as a lot of NG WAF players have moved into the API protection market, that if you weren't protecting APIs yesterday, you weren't a next generation WAF, right? Because APIs are the web. So that merger between um, web apps and API protections was kind of an inevitable outcome of evolutions in, um, in design patterns, really, as used by modern web developers. The multifaceted attacks, you know, we've seen over the last year, even uh, an exponential increase in the sophistication of attacks. It's no longer, you know, one person banging out curl scripts and trying to, to you know, find a crack in some web app. It's a sophisticated network of organized bots that are cycling IP address, that are cycling user agents, that are cycling attack patterns that are staying low and slow, below the threshold of detection of other solutions. And they're just going and rattling a doorknob here and pushing a window to see if it's open there, right? That doorknob they're rattling is a cred stuffing attack. That window they're trying to see if it's open, that's an account takeover or it's recon. Um, and they're doing this on, on timescales that span you know, days, weeks, or months. So we'll see this low and slow attack pattern We'll see progression up a kill chain. We'll nest, you know, potentially see like, hey, is recon. There's, there's clearly a next step that the bot has taken um, now that it got some info back you know, with an innocuous request. And those kinds of attacks make the differentiation between a DDoS attack and um, you know, an, a, a cred stuffing attack or any of the OWASP top 10 or OWASP top 10 API. They're all kind of um, homogenous from the perspective of the attacker. Right? It's just one more thing that they'll cycle through trying and trying and trying and trying using low cost compute resources, staying below the threshold of detection of other solutions. And you know, there's clearly money in that. So you know, pulling all of these together into one um, format, one market, one set of critical capabilities, I think has, has been an, a normal evolution of the NGWAF market. 
Yeah, so basically, you know, if, if you're deploying these controls in a siloed manner, you're, you're missing the big picture as attacks have started to become more sophisticated and kind of bounce from threat vector to threat vector. If you don't have that holistic visibility across, you know, all your APIs, the, the, the app itself, you know, some insight into uh, bot traffic, you know, you can kind of be blind to broader campaigns that are targeting your organization. So it's really- Yeah, as, as we see, John, you know, the, the siloed solutions might be great when you're doing forensics, right? Um, when you're doing forensics on a breach, you've got, you know, the data, you, you've got the views, you've got the auditability of, you know, kind of like how traffic got to your origins. But the siloed approaches are not great at, you know, analyzing real traffic in real time and making real blocking decisions. And that's where, you know, again, looking back at the market as it existed, you know, prior to the founding of, of the company, our founders looked at the solution and said, look, you know, coming at it uh, as, as our co-founder and CTO did as, you know, a professional pen tester, there's attributes inside traffic that kind of colloquially are sketchy, right? So if, if, you, if you think about risk and risk behavioral analysis, what, what we are able to do is, is first, you know, obviously identify an attacking entity, right? That, that's in a sense the easy part, it's a combination of TLS, fingerprint, user agent. And once we have an attacking entity, we look at what they're actually trying to do. And, and we measure that the way that you would measure um, attack traffic if you were, you know, red team, blue team, right? So we'll look at what the, the traffic's trying to do. We'll measure that against our own kill chain. We'll say, all right, this is a slightly risky behavior, right? It's not terminally risky. It's not block worthy, but that's suspicious. And that suspicious behavior increments a risk score slightly, right? Not enough to block immediately because that would result often in a, a false positive. You might block a developer that's trying to debug something in prod. That's a common use case. Um, but that second little bit of sketchy behavior increments risk score a little bit more. The third one, a little bit more. We increment that low and slow over time as well. So it's not, you know, three, um, three bits of, of risky behavior in 90 seconds. It's it can be three bits of risky behavior over, you know, 90 hours. And with the sophisticated bot attacks that we're seeing, that low and slow detection and enumeration of risk is important. We get to a threshold and we say, all right, enough is enough. You have done some bad things. We're going to block you. There's still a chance in, in practice that that's a false positive. So we'll then sort of decrement score over time. And if it was a false positive, if, if it was, you know, somebody... Uh, with a you know a malformed bookmark coming in out of the clear blue sky and and hitting an endpoint that's no longer there, fine, right? Their risk score decrements over time. We let them back in. If, as is often the case, it's actually a bad actor, they're blocked. That may be enough, right? We have proven that the door is locked. The bad guys may go down the street and rattle someone else's doorknobs, right? So part of what we do with this risk risk analysis and, and behavioral analytics is increase the threshold to make it more costly to continue to survey and recon a given site. Now, if they're super tendentious, they may stick around and come back, but if they come back, they're coming back in for us on a hair trigger, and then we block and, and effectively, a real bad actor will drive themselves into a permanent block state, and um, then, you know, they move on, right? So we, we've now made it economically non-viable for them to continue to try to attack one of the sites under the umbrella of our protection. Yeah, attackers are like any business, right? They're looking for the, the easy money. Yeah, they're looking for easy money always, exactly. So we, we touched briefly on DevOps with regards to the disconnect from a tool perspective. Why is it critical that both dev teams and cyber teams have access to the actionable insights that these tools can provide to improve app, application security? So application security requires security in depth, right? That security in depth means everything from, you know, appropriate ciphers and appropriate configuration all the way to a deep, um, you know, from the first day of design AppSec program, right? In order to do that, um, you've got to have teaming between the security team and the DevOps team. 
you've got to have um, a collaboration. You know, we talked before, CISOs can't be impediments to business. Their security teams have to be partnered with Dev to facilitate the provisioning of new applications and new services. So in that world, an integration into the DevOps tool chain is critical. Security and depth is critical, but security and depth is, is difficult, right? I mean, I, I, I've built application security scanning solutions and it is a hard thing to deploy, right? Because it's gotta go all the way back to the compiler. It's gotta be embedded all the way in the agile processes, all the way back at design. And that takes time. And where I think some of the magic of a solution like ThreadX comes in is that we're your best first step towards securing your assets and building that security in depth. So you, you, know, you come in as a CISO, you, you select a solution, a, a WAP solution like ours, you come in, you deploy it, you immediately put a safe perimeter, you've got your, your systems secured from direct line of attack um, via HTTP and HTTPS, right? So having done that, you can then take the time to, you know, do a full asset inventory, train your developers on defensive coding and put in a deeper program of application security that we advocate. Um, you know, we, we don't want to be the only step that, that our customers take in their security journey, but we think we're the best first step. So can you go into a little more detail? What are some of the insights that can be shared, maybe for some of those different personas as these tools are deployed? Sure. So, so for security operators, understanding, you know, variance um, day to day, week to week, and what um, URIs and what endpoints are targeted, right? What we call a top targets view. Um, for security practitioners, a, a real view in real time, you know, kind of in the heat of battle of, variance, you know, minute to minute, what we call a live view of attack heuristics and attack traffic. Um, you know, obviously security misconfigurations, um, you know, we see really sort of simple and basic stuff where uh, origin servers are, are configured to still, uh, to still process um, unencrypted traffic, right? Um, those kinds of security misconfigurations are, are, you know, easy to make, especially in a large enterprise that's moving fast. And getting insight into what's present, you know, in your deployed and as-built architecture, as well as what's getting hit, is pretty critical. So a lot of what I'm hearing is shifting from kind of more of a reactive mode to over over time by kind of checking some of these boxes, making things simpler, moving to a more proactive model. Yeah, that's the idea. The um, you know, if you think about it as as sort of um, filtering noise out of the system, the the, you know, you put a, a WAP in place and now you're cleansing your inbound traffic to your origins. You're taking away a big operational load that you used to have to do, you know, via complicated signature management of an, in, uh, you know, an ineffective NG WAF, right? So you put an effective solution in place, you buy back, um, you buy back time, you buy back resources, and you can put those resources to work proactively to go out and um, you know, adjust configuration at a macro level to, you know, eliminate large scale risk to um, de-deploy rogue or zombie APIs that have slipped into production. So, so those kinds of things, higher level function, higher business value is what operational security professionals have been after, you know, since the dawn of, of the security era. Uh, but they've been hampered and hindered and they haven't been able to move up that value chain because they're busy managing, you know, frankly, hard to manage solutions. So that's actually a great point. And, and there's kind of two sides to this coin with regards to the shortage of skills. There's the fact that there's, there's not enough uh, people, right? And I think that's what you touched on. Um, but then some of those that um, organizations are able to hire, they, they don't have the right level of skills. So you, you hit on the first one. Um, maybe talk a little bit about how a WAP solution like ThreadX can help uh, kind of augment the skills that you do have, not just from a staffing perspective, but kind of up-leveling uh, the analysts you do have? Sure. Well, what, one of the main differentiators in our solution, John, is that we deliver this obviously as a service. It's all cloud-hosted WAP, but every subscriber to our cloud-hosted WAP service gets access to our 24-7 SOC. Um, we deliver the service as a managed service, the 24-7 SOC um, is essentially, they're, they're expert threat hunters. They're expert in layer seven security. They're expert in 
tuning to novel business logic. They're expert in ThreadX, to be honest, right? And our solution, you know, we, we try to make it as, as self-service as possible, but we would never leave our customers high and dry without access to that expertise to have their backs. And for a lot of our customers, you know, one of the, the shifts that we've seen in, in sort of who cares about application security is that the remit has shifted down into the business. And in many cases in B2C companies, we see brand managers calling us because they're getting, you know, their sites are getting clobbered by bot traffic. They're detecting fraud. They're, they're being defrauded. Uh, they're having bots camp out and, and, you know, essentially steal inventory or steal access to, you know, the commodities that the enterprise sells. And so these brand managers need a solution and brand managers are great at brand management. They're not great at layer seven security. It's not their core competency. And layer seven security experts, you know, we all know the shortfall in security expertise in the industry globally. Where do layer seven security experts want to work? They want to work in a company that's doing security. They want security in their job title. They want security analysts in their job title. And they don't want to work at, you know, like the, my favorite made up company, Billy Bob's Corrugated Sheet Metal and Web Applications out of Lubbock, Texas. Right. They, they don't want to go to work there. They want to go to work for a company that everyone understands and knows that's in the security space. So so for us, you know, we can attract and retain those resources. We give them a career path that lets them continue to skill up. We give them an interesting and rewarding job. And by virtue of that, you know, we, we can staff that function out. Many of our customers honestly just can't do it at that scale. They can staff out you know, their core competency and they can build security teams that, that move up value that are sort of you know, security program level, but they're not going to always, all of them, be able to attract, hire and retain and, and continually upskill security analysts that work on this specific problem space. So you know, where we come in is, is we're you know, in a sense, since augmentation to our customers, operational security teams. And, you know, there's a couple of quotes that our customers have used in, um, they were anonymized, but we do a, an NPS survey. One of them referred to our solution as, um, you know, and this is the combination of the technology, the service delivery and the, the 24 seven SOC as a security blanket, which is just like so heartwarming as a provider. And the other said, um, you know, my team has gotten their weekends back. Now, that's good and bad because it means we lost hours, but that's kind of, you know, in a sense why we exist. And, and that notion that, you know, we're there on the front lines for our customers um, is, is, you know, huge. And it's, it's a huge buying point or a decision maker as they analyze other solutions. And it's a point of pride for us. Absolutely. So ThreadX is not the only vendor in the lab space. It's, it's a fragmented space uh, right now for a, a lot of reasons. And you've touched yeah. on some of the differentiators that ThreadX has. I think the fact that um, you have that, that services component would be one. But if you had to narrow it down to the, the one or two really key differentiators between ThreadX and some of the other WAP providers, what would those be? Yeah, it's, it's, um, it is a big market. Um, and some of the players in the market are very big players. Uh, if I look at sort of the, the, 10, um, the 10 largest competitors in the WAP space, uh, there's a total of about 27,000 employees and $10 billion of market cap. And we are not 27,000 employees and $10 billion of, of revenue. Sorry. Um, we're small, but growing. We're small, but mighty. Um, we're small and we're differentiated in the approach that we took to this solution space. The two technical differentiators that really do set us apart is that we were built from scratch to be a WAP solution. Other vendors that have gotten into this space have pivoted from their WAF or their NG WAF service, or they pivoted from their, their bot detection and reputation management services. And they've, in many cases, assembled a solution by um, inorganic development, that is to say, by m a mergers and acquisitions. So they bought companies, rebranded them, assembled them into a solution that's produced this siloed, disintegrated approach to measuring risk. 
what we do differently is we have a single risk engine, right? So our risk engine is looking at all of the inbound traffic. I already told you about that low and slow integrator of risky behavior that we have that gets us to um, a block or a, a tar pit or an interrogate decision. And that single risk engine is a big differentiator. Um, obviously, you know, we've already gone in depth into the attacker centricity, but that notion of looking at the attack traffic, describing intent, and then ascribing risk to that intent, then integrating it, you know, over, over long time scales and over low intensity, is another differentiator. So it makes sense that, you know, I think your top two are, are more on the, the security side, but, you know, we've talked about the need to, you know, fit into those DevOps processes and you're well, so how does, you know, the ThreatX solution really fit into those microservices based architectures, workflows, CI, CD pipelines, et cetera? Sure. So, so we'll take the CI, CD pipeline first. Um, we have a, a web app console that lets you administer, you know, everything about ThreatX, um, but we're a, an API first development shop. So everything that's exposed for an end user to be able to do with our solution is making a RESTful API call. We publish that RESTful API spec and we expose that to our customers. So a customer with a release engineer reasonably skilled in the art can integrate our solution directly into CI CD pipeline, right? So we, we have customers who do end user provisioning, who do um, role-based access control management, who do site provisioning, everything all the way to, to um, you know, fine tuning of rules directly out of you know, their Jenkins um, build, build and deploy environment, right? And, and that's, that's pretty cool. We obviously are a, a great source of data because we are seeing surveying and, and analyzing risk for all of the inbound uh, traffic going to customer origins. All of that content we collect and expose to our, in, uh, to our customers via a service, essentially, you know, it's creatively named Log Emitter. It, it is, um, a data feed, customers take that log emitter, connect the log receiver and connect that content to their SIM or their SOAR. So they've got us as a rich data source for their dashboards, for their you know, own um, meta reports about traffic and, and about attack heuristics. And then um, as far as integration into the environment, we're a container deployed solution, right? So we, so we deploy in a Docker container um, we give our customers the, the container that can run it in our cloud, which is, we think, easiest for them and, and probably best for them because we're good at running our, our sensors. They can take that container and they can run it in their cloud and they can manage it themselves. Or because it's just, you know, essentially a, a Docker container, they can run it on, on their own machine in their own data center. So that hybrid um, capability, the, the ability to be anywhere in a heterogeneous um, multi-cloud environment, multi-CDN, multi-API gateway has let us you know, be able to truthfully say we've never met an app or an API that we can't protect. So you, you touched on the need for security to look more at positive business outcomes. Right, and that, especially at the CISO level, but that's starting to, to filter down. So I think you touched on some of these with regards to uh, you know, better leveraging the, the folks that you have um, from a skills perspective, like we were just talking about, obviously the ability to keep applications up and, and, and running. Any other business outcomes or business value that users should be thinking about when it comes to deploying a lab? Yeah, I, th I think one that, that, you know, it's been around for a long time, but it's, important still is vendor consolidation um, where, where, you know, there's, there's competing solutions that are unit taskers. Um, there's, there's kind of security coming in from the API gateway. There's, there's API specific solutions. There's, um, you know, container specific solutions. There's configuration management around containers. Um, getting, you know, you, you could very easily build a tool suite that had you know, 10, 15 vendors in it. And that's hard to manage and it creates a different problem for the enterprise. So I think a WAP solution, the nice thing about an integrated solution is that it's, you know, one tool for many architectures, one tool for many attack patterns and having fewer, you know, fewer vendors to manage, fewer vendors to run through procurement, 
uh, and then you know fewer tools to to master and integrate into your tool chain let's you know it lets customers focus on what's important to them which is building apps that support their business and keeping them secure so we've, we've touched on a lot of different topics today let's wrap up last question from me with you know thinking about what's what's the risk if businesses aren't already thinking about pivoting from a traditional laugh to more of the risk-based WAP approach that you talk about? So, so I don't want to be an ambulance chaser. And I, I managed to not be my, my entire career in application security. Um, so don't read this the wrong way. But, but you can see the risk in the headlines every day. Uh, the risk is breach of PII, breach of PHI. Uh, it's, you know, account takeover and, and you know, a foothold in a network that lets an attacker live off the land and compromise systems. The reason they're trying to compromise systems is to compromise data. The reason they're trying to compromise data is that they can monetize that data. And that vector is and remains, you know, the number one business risk, right? So, so be insecure at your own risk. And the risk is, you know, ransomed data, ransomed systems, breached data, uh, breached account credentials, and massive reputational damage to say nothing of, you know, the legislative requirements and fines associated with stewardship of customer data. Um, data is at the core of everything we do. Every app that gets built is about providing access to making decisions from or restricting access to data. And protecting that, the sacred trust of the CISO and the, the operational security team and then the dev team. Um, and shirking that is, uh, you know, it's, that's the big risk. And, and, you know, it puts companies out of business. With that, I think we're just about out of time. I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's discussion. We certainly hope you found it helpful in shedding some light on this dynamic and emerging market. Tom, thanks so much for being with us today to share your thoughts and insights on some of the challenges and the way forward to securing modern applications. Awesome. Thank you, John. Thank you.